Hi everyone, brief lecture on castles, particularly crusader castles. Um, but what I want to do is just put it into a bit more context for you. So I'm going to look at crusader archaeology as a whole um, and look at castle archaeology. And then from that, I'll also quickly look at um, some churches because they do fall into that, um, into those brackets uh, in a way that I will explain in a, in a little bit. Um, so firstly, if we look at look at castles, um, castles are primarily administrative centres. They're not um, necessarily military. So when you look at the original Norman castles, which are what the first Crusader castles are based on, they take a Mott and Bailey form. So that's um, a basic earthen hill, um, sometimes natural, uh, sometimes man-made. And then on top of that is a small tower or a keep. Um, and then the hill or any settlements around that would be enclosed um, by a wattle fence or by a wooden fence um, and palisade. These then kind of develop, um, which are what you see generally in the archaeological record now, into stone castles. Um, so some of you in your lectures did talk about them um, over in Eastern Europe during the, uh, the Crusades over there. Um, as you get the Mott and Bailey form, and then the keep becomes built by stone, and they're the, st the first stone castles. And then eventually this kind of curtain palisade around the edge of wood is also replaced by um, stone. And in some places, such as in Beaumaris in North Wales, um, which is often viewed as the best example of a defensive castle in the world, um, you get multiple curtain walls. So at Beaumaris there is a central kind of um, a central curtain which into that is built a chapel and the, ki the kitchens um, would all be wooden structures inside that built into built al alongside the wall um, and then there are another two concentric rings around the edge of that um, forming this defensive structure um, and just to show how effective that is Beaumaris was never completely finished and yet when it was attacked in the 13th century by I want to say Llewellyn ab Griffith um, he didn't actually get in, and Beaumaris was never successfully conquered. So, those that castle idea, it's important to look into the context of Western Europe and Eastern, well, Western Europe when looking at the Crusades, firstly in the Holy Land and secondly in Eastern Europe, um, because they do take the form of those that are found in the West. Um, so firstly, if you look at the first castles that you find in the Crusades, uh, we're looking at the First Crusade here, mostly. Um, so that's start, set off uh, by Pope Urban in uh, 1095. Well, the speech was 1094, but the Crusade itself happened in 1095. Um, by which point you're looking into the early 12th century by the time any castles appear, um, as the First Crusade began as a People's Crusade and a Peasant's Crusade with very few um, actual warriors and knights taking, um, taking the crusading vow. Um, so the first ones that we have records of uh, are at Accra, um, where they built stone towers outside the city, outside the gates of the city, um, as purely military structures. So these structures um, literally were there to house a small um, garrison of men, to keep an eye on the gates and to see if anybody from the uh, Islamic army or any Saracens were entering or leaving the city and they were to stop anything like that happening. So it was to hold on to the siege, the, the original siege towers, if you like, um, rather than the, the wooden structures that we know as siege towers today. Um, secondly, you've then got um, places such as Jerusalem, which Jerusalem obviously being the centre of the Crusade and the centre of the Holy Land, um, everybody wanted to attack Jerusalem. Um, the, the First Crusade uh, saw Christendom uh, capture Jerusalem, and Jerusalem became uh, the first Crusader state, and it was um, there that the people that would become known as the Latins were able to hold and rule the Holy Land for another um, century or so. Um, under people such as Guy de Lusignan, uh, Baldwin I, um, the kind of the big names of, Crus of um, Crusader history. Um, with uh, sorry, with Jerusalem, we found that there was no kind of central keep. 
there was a castle at Jerusalem, and that was built. And there was also um, the Temple of the Mount, uh, which is actually a mosque, and it's not the Temple of Solomon, as they thought it was at the time, but was in fact a mosque built in the 6th century um, that was then taken over by the Templars. So that became a military centre and a religious centre um, that wanted to be defended uh, quite strongly by the Christian people of Western Europe. So what they did is they then built these circular curtain walls around Jerusalem. So the whole of Jerusalem as a city had these massive walls built around it and they're still there today. Um, and they they took quite a pounding over the next few hundred years, but they on the most part survived um, until the fall of Jerusalem in the late 13th century. Um, and I can't remember his name. That's really bad. But I think it was... Uh, one of the Lusignans, Baldric de Lusignan, I think it might have been the last king, um, king of Jerusalem then, and the last king of the Crusader states. So the important thing to note, to note there is there is a massive difference in the Crusader archaeology between these towers that are built and the, the massive city defences, but they are all classed as castles and it is all Crusader castle archaeology. Um, but what's important to look at when looking at this is how the crusaders viewed defensive structures and what they viewed as was important to defend in the near in the near east during this period so you can look primarily at jerusalem as i said um that was the focal point and acra um and kind of many of the cities that are along what is now palestine and the lebanon um and along the coast of the levant and slightly further inland and formed um, kind of the frontier. And they obviously, as be being frontier cities had and frontier towns, had very, very heavy fortifications and defences. If you look further inland, um, you then find kind of the stately, not stately homes as such, but the medieval equivalent of a stately home or a manor. Um, these are where the nobility would tend to live and they were definitely the administrative centres. So. It was at these points that you would find um, kind of the knights and lords of Western Europe who went over, um, particularly in the case of the First and Second Crusades, it was the Franks, which is how they got the name of the Latins. Um, they went over and they built these um, these manor these manors, which were fortified. However, you'd find that if they actually came across any bit of force, these fortifications would fall quite quickly and the house wouldn't particularly stand up for much defence. As you saw um, in the time about the third, the third um, between the Second and the Third Crusade with uh, Salah Hadin and how quickly he managed to sweep across um, the Crusader states before the, the eventual fall of Jerusalem. Um, but the thing with these is you've got to look at what particular buildings are fortified and how they are. So these manors, which are administrative centres, are not particularly well fortified. And yet you find some, uh, some monasteries which have three metre thick walls and very heavy fortifications. Now the monasteries, obviously apart from looking at um, the Knights of St John, the Hospitaller, or um, the Knights Templar, or um, the Knights of, um, of St Lazarus, these are military monastic orders and they fight as monks, which is a kind of a phenomenon from the crusade. But the majority of Christian monastic orders, um, so the Cistercians, the Benedictines, the um, kind of, they don't fight and there's no need for them to have fortifications other than the threat of Islam. So in this point, in, um, in the Crusader states, the majority of people that live there are Muslim or Jewish. Um, and all they have seen in their lifetime, really, is Christians come in and destroy everything that they know, um, which sadly is quite a, a common narrative in history. But we, we see that. So the biggest threat to uh, these peaceful monastic orders, really, is the local population. And there are not enough knights in the world in this point to defend everywhere. There isn't a standing army like we have in the modern day. In fact, the majority of the Crusader armies were peasants who 
wanted to atone for their sins and they went on crusade um, to fight for God and to have their, sin, their sins annulled at the promise of the crusade. So these people couldn't defend themselves, they are peaceful monks and they relied therefore heavily on the fortifications of them. Um, so if you want to look into crusader, um, crusader defences, churches are actually a really good place to look um, because they are such kind of solid buildings with solid foundations. Um, the perfect example of this is the Temple of the Mount, which, although I said was built in the 6th century um, as, a, as a mosque, it was adapted by the Templars in, in Jerusalem, um, and they, the foundations and the tunnels and the, um, the extensions onto this that, were, that was built by, um, built by the, the Franks and, and the Western Templars are truly of kind of outstanding um, thickness, to be honest. They, there's no way that anything from the medieval period would damage them, and they still stand today um, after b bombing and shelling in th th throughout modern history uh, with the wars between Palestine and Israel. Um, so, generally speaking, the, arch like the archaeology of, of castles in, in this period and is I think it's slightly underlooked at. Um, Adrian Boas of the University of Haifa has done a lot of work on Crusader archaeology and he's basically the for, like the foremost name in Crusader archaeology. Um, and he has he has written a fair bit on on the castles and on uh, on the churches in this period but they're not looked at anywhere near as much as you find they are in Western Europe. Um, so if you were to look at the archaeology of um, the Tower of London or of Harlech Castle or Carnarvon, they are written about in huge tomes um, and people have spent their life studying these one, like, one building. Um, whereas what I've seen to have come across with Crusader archaeology is it seems to be this one person, Adrian Boas, that has taken it upon himself to write about everything. So it's not written in as much detail as you would hope. I think partly that is due to the um, political issues going on in the region at the moment. It is quite hard to go and start saying, look, I want to dig up and find about the history of Christianity in this land, when you then got the people that live around it that aren't necessarily Christians, and there are so many religions there, and it's such... Um, it, it's, it's on a knife edge for the whole political um, kind of political aspect of the re of the region. So, if you were to look at a site and focus too much upon one religion, the people in the locality who wanted to know about their local history would start to get um, insulted by the fact that you weren't looking as much at their religion. I think that's one of the reasons why people haven't looked at it very much because it is ethically quite a, a, a difficult subject to look at. Um, but in saying that there is a lot known and we're lucky that the, the history of the Crusades is so well recorded uh, mostly by monks but also um, the Arabic history of the Crusades is um, very well recorded and is used a lot by historians today um, you can say I've not actually looked at any of it myself but I've, I've been to um, conferences where people have spoken about it um, and it does give a very a very different view on it um, so yeah, that's kind of the history of um, and the archaeology of the of Crusades, and obviously the the development that we see um, in Western Europe is both influenced and influences the archaeology of the Crusader frontiers. Um, so Carnarvon Castle, again in North Wales, one of Edward the, um, the Edwardian castles in Wales, uh, it's built in the early 13th century, early to mid 13th century. Um, is built in the style of Constantinople and it has banding around the around the walls in the same style as the walls of Constantinople. Um, this is often viewed as the fact that Edward never went on crusade himself um, and it's viewed as kind of a, a homage to the crusades and if I had been on crusade then I would have seen this site but I haven't been so I will build it myself. Um, so other than that we've got kind of we've got to look at it as one sweeping overview of the archaeology of castles and not as the archaeology of castles in the Levant or the archaeology of castles in 
Lithuania or the archaeology of castles in France because they all bounce off each other and the archaeology reflects how the influences spread. So by the time you get to um, the early modern period um, and you get to kind of 14th, 15th century and you find that they're starting to build these star-based fort, these star-shaped forts um, which show the development of artillery. So the point of a, a star-shaped fort is that there is no blind spot. Um, with kind of square forts, they're perfectly good in the Roman period and they are seen throughout the medieval period, but all you have to do is mine under one corner and all the walls collapse. With a star-shaped fort, you've got artillery all the way around it and you've got viewpoints everywhere and there is no one corner to, to mine under because you can mine under one of the edge corners they might not necessarily be seen, but all that's going to do is collapse one of kind of the prongs of the star, and it's not actually going to get you inside the fort itself. Um, and you start to see those. They're particularly prominent in Britain and France um, during this period, um, as they are from kind of the military renaissance. Um, but you do start to see them prop up um, across the uh, Eastern Europe um, in, from those, those later crusades. So it is very much um, looking at what the style and topography of these castles you find in the west, the east, and the near and um, the near east of Asia. Um, secondly, I mean, obviously we've looked now at the ar the archaeology of the actual structures themselves, um, but you want to look at what was going on inside them. So. Um, as I said, castles are largely administrative centres and they're found in, um, in the centre of agricultural land, so they have these, these viewpoints. Um, and they're absolutely brilliant for kind of intimidating your local population. So what you can do is you can turn up and say, right, this is now my land, I am your lord, and I'm going to make sure that you do all of this work, when actually... I'm not going to do that at all, it's I'm going to intimidate you into working for me and make sure that you pay my taxes, because I have a big castle, and if you don't pay your taxes, then I will send some of my garrison um, to attack you and to burn down your house or your farm, or I will imprison you and keep you in the castle where you can't get out. So they are massive pieces of intimidation, um, and... They are not to be messed with and not to be and that they are to be feared sorry they are they're definitely kind of fear worthy structures so if you think in this period that very few houses were above one story high if they were they had a shop and then a house above it and these westerners have turned up and they are building structures that are five six stories high and built in solid stone whereas the most you can afford really is a bit of wattle and daub um the fear of it is is quite something to is no mean kind of no mean feat and it is quite quite fearsome. Um, but then, as you went through um, like the the Eastern Crusades um, and the Teutonic Knights are, are per, and the Livonian Knights are perfect examples of these. They are there to convert the pagans of Eastern Europe to Christianity. So their castles often take the form of um, monastic castles in a way where they have the military aspect but they are also monasteries and they are quite different because they are um, cloistered to a certain extent and they reflect monastic life to that extent so there is often agricultural land and gardens and kitchens um, and somewhat palatial in that way um, as throughout the medieval period you see that palaces develop in a monastic style and reflect monasteries rather than the other way around so by this point these castles become palatial with um, with the monastery within it but also have um, a definite military aspect of the high walls, the watchtowers um, and the military garrison that is based there um, obviously in, in Lithuania and eastern Germany and Poland in that point there is a, a a lot of um, pagan population who view it as their their right to remove Christianity from this invading Christianity from from their lands. Um, so they will do everything they can to remove churches to, and to burn down monasteries. So there, 
they have to be fortified in this way. Um, and it is very effective in doing that. Um, but also you, you find that they have, again, this agri um, agricultural controlling of the region. Um, which is why if you look at the, the assemblages that are found um, when these sites are excavated, there's a lot of agricultural finds. So you find reaping hooks, you find um, kind of plows and um, other, other tools that are used in the field. Um, rather than finding vast amounts of armaments and, and weapons. Um, but that could also be due to the fact that armour and weaponry is very expensive. And it is um, the kind of thing that's passed down from generation to generation. So if you go, um, if you go to the British Museum today and you look at the medieval the section of the British Museum, there are vast amounts of weapons and armour that have been passed down. Um, I know for a fact there is an armoury museum in Poland that has not changed in the past 600 years, and it has the same amount of armour and weaponry that was there in the 14th and 15th centuries. And they have not been lost, and they are, they are looked after. Um, so it is important to to view these things in that way um, swords are a sign of wealth and ability um, they are not they are not cheap to make and they take a long time to make um, so they really are a, a sign of prowess and importance so you're not just going to toss that away with someone when they die um, but you may you you'll pass that down from father to son from father to son um, through the generations so they're not going to be necessarily be found in the archaeological record um, and also it's a problem that's found with battlefield sites is when the fighting's over and everyone is dead on the field people will go and they'll steal those weapons and they'll steal the armour because that is what is expensive and they can sell that on um, and people look after it which is great for us because it means that we have a large amount of um, weapons from the period that survive and they are now in the museums and private collections are all around the world um, but they're not found in context and as I'm sure Shreya will have told you the phrase context is key as soon as you take any archaeological find out of its context and you lose the context it's in then we have no actual understanding of that so yes we can say oh look in this period they did have these swords but we don't know the context that it was found in it might have been found on a battlefield or it might have been found in a palace and it was actually for show. So we, we need to know the context of it. Um, and the military aspect of the Crusades is largely lost for this that side, apart from what we find in illustrations um, and in descriptions from the period. Um, so I've now kind of rabbited on for about 25 minutes or so. Um, I look forward to hearing some questions for you. Um, all the best.